This is Brother Peter Diamond, VaticanCatholic.com, continuing with the discussion of Our Lady of Guadalupe and the fall of the Aztec Empire in Mexico. In this section, I want to focus again primarily on the events that preceded Our Lady's appearance in 1531, and specifically the amazing journey of Cortes and the other conquistadors and what led up to the takeover of the Aztec Empire. In the last section, I spent some time talking about how wicked the Aztec culture was, their practice of human sacrifice. I will cover some more details in this section. But I want to comment on how amazing it was that Cortes and his men, who amounted to only 508 people at the start, as Richard Lee Marx tells us in his book Cortes on page 41, and they wound up overthrowing the Aztec Empire, which encompassed some 15 million people. When you think about that by itself, it's a miracle. Now, it's certainly true that as Cortes and his men advanced into the areas approaching Mexico, they gained many Indian allies who were indispensable in what transpired later on. But the fact of the matter is that 508 men got off the boat in the New World and wound up overthrowing this empire of 15 million. We believe that's an obvious sign of divine providence assisting this Catholic army because Cortez's army was undoubtedly a Catholic army, even though it should be granted that not everyone in the army was always of the highest moral character. As I was discussing the gruesome nature of the Aztecs' diabolical religious rituals in the last part, I talked about how frequently they sacrificed humans to their false gods, and how they would do it, how they would kick them down the temple steps after they pulled out the still beating heart from the person's chest. One point I did not mention was the appalling fact that these Aztecs would sometimes skin their sacrificial victim, skin his face off, and then wear the person's face. In his book Cortez, Richard Lee Marx describes it on pages 209 and 210. He says, quote, Such flaying of human beings, which was not uncommon among the Indians, would be done just after the victims had been sacrificed. And Indian priests would wear the face skins while the skins were slippery with blood and body fluids. At such moments, like the moments of human sacrifice, the mental, emotional, and spiritual state of the Indians was beyond the comprehension of Europeans." End quote. As the Spaniards encountered the brutality of the Aztecs' religious practices, they were baffled. As Richard Lee Marx explains on page 88 of his book Cortez, published by Weatherhill Press, quote, In the prayer house of this Nahuatl-speaking group, Cortez found fifty freshly slain corpses before an enormous bloodied statue of Huitzilopochtli, the war god whom Montezuma had once served as priest. The extent of this sacrifice, the fleshly mass of fifty butchered bodies drenched in blood, baffled and dismayed the Spaniards. What shocked them into silence in these Indian temples was the Indians' chilling indifference toward human life. End quote. So, they were confronted with an empire of pure evil, and as they began their journey, just 508 of them at the start, they were encountering various tribes in the areas surrounding the Aztec Empire. Many of these surrounding tribes had to pay tribute to the Aztecs, and the tribute often involved human beings. They would give them to the Aztecs, and the Aztecs would sacrifice them to their false gods. But as they got closer to the actual Aztec capital itself, they came upon an independent province called Tlaxcala. That's spelled T-L-A-S-C-A-L-A, or a variant is T-L-A-X-C-A-L-A. This was a strong independent province that was near the Aztec territory, but was 
an enemy to the Aztecs. They hated the Aztecs. And the Aztecs had not been able to fully subjugate them. When Cortes would advance to these various tribes, he would offer them peace, and he would try to come in peace. But the Tlaxcalans wanted no part of that. They thought that he was an ally to the Aztecs, and they wanted to test the Spaniards in battle. And what transpired was simply a miracle. And it was a miracle because this independent province, Tlaxcala, consisted of some 150,000 families. And the Aztecs, as I said already, had never been able to fully subjugate it. Now, Carroll points out that he believes the reason that didn't occur is because the Aztecs never moved with their full force against this province because this province would provide the Aztecs with a steady flow of victims for human sacrifice. Nevertheless, this was an extremely formidable independent province. At this point, the Spaniards had a little bit over 300 men, and they were attacked by 40 to 50,000 of these Tlaxcalans. Not all of them attacked at once, which was part of the miracle in and of itself, but at various times the odds were 100 to 1 or close to 200 to 1. On page 94 of his book, Cortez, Richard Lee Marks says, quote, Then out from hiding came about 40,000 Tlaxcalans who had been waiting in ambush. Heavy fighting went on all day. The Spaniards could do no more than hold their lines and endure the showering of stones, darts, spears, and arrows, while repelling the Tlaxcalans hand to hand. At the end of the day, the Tlaxcalans withdrew. And he goes on to say, miraculously, not a single Spaniard had been killed outright, though several were mortally wounded. End quote. Now, it's very significant that this author admits that it was a miracle that not one Spaniard was killed outright against an army of 40,000 people, and there were only a few hundred of them. And I say it's interesting that this author mentions that because he is somewhat irreverent in his approach. It's an extremely interesting book. Uh, very detailed, but he mentions evolution as if it's a fact probably seven times in his book, and so this is not an orthodox Catholic writing here, and he tends to downplay all providential signs in this conquest, and so when he says this was miraculous, it was miraculous, and this victory by warding off the Tlaxcalans not only saved their lives, but it proved to be indispensable in the later conquest of the much larger Aztec Empire. Because without their assistance, barring more direct miracles from God, they would not have a chance against the Aztec Empire. And so once the Tlaxcalans were defeated, and it should be emphasized that the Spaniards not only repelled them, they defeated them. As a result, the Tlaxcalans offered peace and were willing to help the Spaniards in whatever way they could and to become their allies against the Aztecs. And there's an interesting quote about how they became allies after this battle and the respect the Tlaxcalans had for the Spaniards and how they brought them food and sheltered them in commodious dwellings. It should also be mentioned that Prior to engaging in battles, Cortes and his Catholic army would deliver a required speech to the people they were encountering. They would offer peace, and they would also say, as is recorded on page 48 of this book, Cortes, quote, The Indians were called upon to accept the primacy of Christ and the King. All Indians were urged to accept their vassalage and consent to Christian preaching, thus assuring themselves of peace and many other benefits and the Indians were told that horrors would befall them if they resisted, in which case whatever happened would be the Indians' own fault, end quote. And as Cortes would enter various temples and find more examples of human sacrifice, he would smash the idols, remove them. In the place of the idols, he would put up a cross or an image of Our Lady. They would not always do that, however, and that's because they feared that when they would leave the area, the Indians might desecrate the image of the cross. Following their victory over Tlaxcala, Montezuma, who was the ruler of the Aztecs, he was astonished. 
and it was already widely believed among the Indians that the Spaniards were gods or divine in some way. And as Warren Carroll points out on page 36 of his book, Our Lady of Guadalupe and the Conquest of Darkness, quote, Cortez and Bernal Diaz both explicitly attributed the victory, that is the victory over Tlaxcala, to the direct intervention of God. When Montezuma heard the astonishing news, he was all the more sure that the invaders were gods, end quote. And that brings us to the important point concerning Quetzalcoatl. And while the actual meaning and history of Quetzalcoatl is convoluted and disputed, Quetzalcoatl was one of the false gods of the Aztecs. He was known as the Feathered Serpent. But Quetzalcoatl was also associated with a chief of the nation that preceded the Aztec Empire. And there was a legend among the peoples of that area that this individual, who was semi-divine in their eyes, would return and reclaim his kingdom. And some people associated Quetzalcoatl with a more benign redeemer type figure who was different in certain ways from the typical Aztec false gods. There's quite a bit of dispute about the matter, but the point here is that this Quetzalcoatl legend was very important in how the Aztec emperor acted toward Cortes as he heard the reports of the Spanish Catholic army's advance closer and closer to his territory. He feared for his kingdom. He believed on some level that he was doomed, that perhaps Cortes represented Quetzalcoatl and was coming to reclaim the territory and overthrow his Aztec empire. And it becomes very significant when Cortes actually enters the capital of the Aztecs, Tenochtitlan, which is now Mexico City. Another interesting tidbit that fits into this widespread belief that the Spaniards and the Catholic army of Cortes were divine in some way is that as they were marching into the mountain regions, a dormant volcano went off, terrifying the people of the area. It was Popocatepetl, and Richard Lee Marx mentions it on page 116 of his book, Cortez. Quote, the Aztecs and the Tlaxcalans said they had never before seen such smoke from Popocatepetl. Obviously, the mountain was upset in some way, or perhaps was acclaiming the arrival of the Spaniards. End quote. After their victory over Tlaxcala, which was obviously a great positive for them, they were nevertheless wounded and becoming discouraged, many of the Spaniards. Marx explains on page 96, quote, Scared, strained, and nervous, these Spaniards who grumbled had comfortable establishments in Cuba and wanted to return. They said it was crazy for a force of 400 to dare to invade this empire. They had nearly been overcome now by a tribe that was barely able to hold out against the Aztecs. God only knew what would happen when the Spaniards would face Montezuma's vast armies. End quote. And this relates to another important point, which is that early on in his journey, Cortes made the bold move to scuttle, that is, to sink his own ships. And he did this to remove the temptation for members of his army to go back to the coast and sail away. And this would obviously be a strong one, considering the almost insurmountable odds against the success of their endeavor and the hardships they would endure. But by doing so, they left themselves essentially in a situation where they would either be successful in subduing this huge empire, or they would die. As Carroll says on page 31 of his book, quote, Hernan Cortez and his 300 Spaniards turned their backs to the shores of Nightmare and their faces to the keep of the hummingbird wizard. If one estimates 20% of the 15 million people of the Aztec Empire as men capable of bearing arms, the odds against them were precisely 10,000 to 1. Bernal Diaz, who was there, put it best, quote, let the curious reader see whether there were ever in the universe men who had such daring. End quote. 